Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled Advancements in UTI Testing, a Multi-Omics Approach. This webinar is part of the Clinical Diagnostics and Research event, and I'm Susie Valdez of Labroots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labroots and sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific. For more information, please go visit our sponsor's site at thermofisher.com. So let's get started. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to first participate by communicating with other attendees using our new live chat feature during this presentation. You can find that chat located at the right of your screen. You can also participate by submitting as many questions as you'd like during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Now, if you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, just click on the help desk button located at the bottom of your screen within the navigation bar or from the lobby. Finally, as a reminder, this presentation is educational and offers free continuing education credits. Click on the continuing education credits link located at the abstract window below the presentation window and follow the process to obtain those credits. I now present today's speaker, Dr. David Bonoff, a CSO and co-founder of Pathnostics. For a complete biography of our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top left of your screen. Dr. Bonoff, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you. I'd like to... Um... Uh, thanks, Thermo Fisher, and then for providing this opportunity for us to discuss advancements in urinary tract uh, infection testing. UTIs are a very um, important clinical problem, and uh, especially with our aging population, it's becoming uh, more and more of an issue. Uh, they're the second most common infection among the elderly, and are one of the most common reasons for antibiotic prescriptions. Um, the problem really comes from the bad outcomes associated with management of these urinary tract infections, especially in the elderly, um, over time. Uh, and, and we see these uh, bad outcomes that manifest themselves as increasing numbers of antibiotic resistant infections, increased hospitalizations, and urosepsis. Uh, next slide, please. When we look at it from a societal impact, uh, we can note that this, this becomes a very, very important clinical problem. Um, it results in approximately 10 and a half million uh, office visits annually and accounts for almost 50% of all Medicare emissions from long-term uh, health care centers. And when we look at it in total, what we really see is a $13 billion impact in the health care system. Um, clinicians, especially urologists, to have uh, UTI infections as a, as a primary function, uh, focus, really see the impact in their own office settings. If you look at the standard urology uh, practice, up to 50% of all of their office time during the day um, is focused around managing um, these very common infections, but common infections that once again can have significant um, bad outcomes. For example, we know that a third of infections uh, currently illustrate resistance to antibiotics, and we're seeing uh, dramatic increases in the number of patients uh, who are showing not only uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria, uh, but also a large number of cases of urosepsis associated um, with uh, the, the improper or uh, ill-advised management of these uh, infections. Uh, next slide, please. So let, let's kind of walk our way through um, how this solution was developed and uh, work through then some of the evidence associated uh, with the development of this test and where we really see it's going. Um, a lot of this is probably important to put in context to a significant change um, in how urinary tract infections are viewed in, uh, in general. Uh, if we were to go back in even four or five years, we would note that in medical schools, it is still common to teach that urine is sterile and that urinary tract in, infections are caused by one or two organisms. In fact, three or more organisms uh, based on current microbiology guidelines are actually uh, considered uh, contaminated specimens. So as we look at this, it's important to understand that we're going through um, an evolution not only in testing methodologies, but in the thought press process uh, 
uh, revolving around what is an actual infection, what are its constituents, and how does this all work in context. And it all basically goes back to standard urine culture. If we consider the, the data sets that have been developed um, over the last 100 years, they all revolve around the standard urine culture where you take, take basically an agar plate, you're going to streak um, organisms from a urine sample across that plate. If it grows up overnight, it's positive. If nothing grows up, it's negative. The problem is, is this has produced what uh, Dr. Wolf has described out of Loyola University um, as an E. coli-centric vision of the universe. Because frankly, what we see from standard urine culture isn't so much a representation of what organisms may be driving the infection, but what organisms from that urine sample were able to grow on the agar plate. So what we see then is, is in many ways, a biased result, because what we're doing is showing what we can see rather than what's actually there. This really led to the development of this, what we call our guidance UTI diagnostic solution. And the whole point of it is, is what we really need to understand is, is in these patients who are symptomatic, and this is very important, these types of tests are not an appropriate way to look at um, patients who are not presenting with symptoms. This isn't, a, this isn't a screening test. This is really a test designed to look at patients who are presenting with system, uh, symptoms consistent with urinary tract infection and asking a very important question. What organisms are actually driving this infection? Because, I mean, what we're really seeing in the bladder, in essence, is a dysbiosis. You know, we're, we're in a situation where, where many of these patients have a uh, microbiome, and there's been a disruption in this microbiome. We now have uh, growth of a of subset of organisms that normally might not be found there, or at least in those proportions. And so now we want to ask a dynamic question. What organism, bacterial, viral, or fungal, may be present in that urine sample that is driving this infection? So the original uh, test that we developed with Thermo Fisher about six years ago looked at a small subset of organisms, which at the time were thought to be driving urinary tract infections. Um, over the last several years, as the academic uh, uh, research has driven a better understanding of what organisms might be causative, um, this panel has expanded. Um, and it now represents a large subset of gram-positive and gram-negative organisms that would normally be missed by standard urine culture. But it's great. We've identified something. How does that reflect how then you treat? How do you develop a treatment algorithm uh, derived just from the genetic information found from that sample? Well, the truth is, it's not only difficult, it probably uh, uh, produces an inaccurate result. So we started with an or the idea we were going to look at only organisms. So we ID the, the sample. We then looked at the presence or absence of antibiotic resistance genes. Here's where the challenge started. So we, we look back five years. We've identified the organism. We've looked at trying to develop a panel for antibiotic resistance genes. But the challenge was really twofold. First of all, not all antibiotic resistance genes for all of these organisms have been identified. At the same time, we're going to see situations where you can identify an antibiotic resistance gene, but you actually don't have susceptibility. Why? Well, it's basic genetics in many cases. The presence or absence of a, uh, a DNA sequence does not necessarily correspond to whether or not it's functional and to the degree to which um, it's expressed. And these create conundrums. So what we basically found um, and, and in a uh, paper that's uh, being released in the next couple of weeks, what we've basically been shown is about 40% of the time, um, there is a discordant result between the presence or absence of antibiotic resistance genes and actual antibiotic susceptibility. About 20% of the time, we find an antibiotic resistance gene, but don't, don't see re uh, resistance. And about 20% of the time, we get resistance in the absence of an antibiotic resistance gene. So then how do we come up with a functional result? Because it's all really about treating the patient. So we went back to the biological question we were looking at, and it was clear that culture was missing a significant number of organisms. So isn't the question, if you have this dysbiotic um, condition, rather than what organism is causing the infection, 
Perhaps the better question is, is what combination of organisms are driving an infection? And doesn't the treatment then have to be tailored to answer that important biological question? So we developed what we termed a pooled antibiotic susceptibility test. And basically what this test is, is it, 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 it queries the urine and asks a basic question. What antibiotic will get rid of these uropathogens that have been identified in such a way that we can disrupt this dysbiotic condition, and in doing so, have a much better likelihood of actually having a real result when we treat the patient. Next slide, please. From a methodologic standpoint, the ID and antibiotic resistance uh, test is very straightforward. You're basically taking a urine sample, you're doing a DNA extraction, um, we then identify the pathogens and antibiotic resistance genes. In this particular case, we look at 41 specific organisms and over 30 antibiotic resistance genes from seven different classes. Um, this produces that, once again, very important information. What is it and what antibiotic resistance genes are present? But now we, we further then want to look at the question of, so what is the appropriate antibiotic to actually treat this group of organisms that we see? Um, next slide, please. And when we look at it, this is where this pooled antibiotic susceptibility test really comes into play. Because what we do know is, is if we have several groups of organisms found together, that these bacterial interactions can drive significant changes in antibiotic susceptibility, both upregulating and downregulating antibiotic susceptibility merely due to the presence of these additional species. And, and really, once again, this is, a, this is, you know, a in vivo phenomena that we're really, you know, tapping into. Because we understand that when they work together, they're going to share metabolic byproducts. They do this under stress in ways to try to uh, manage um, this new challenge that they face, the presence of an antibiotic. How can we now survive in doing in this environment? And to survive it, what they basically say is, let's cooperate, let's work together. So what we've been able to identify through this process and, and is uh, already been published is basically data that suggests that there is a significant subset of paired and groups of organisms that have different antibody susceptibility testing in the presence of these additional organisms. And this is really consistent with uh, other peer-reviewed uh, work that's uh, come out over the last uh, decade or more. Next slide, please. So how does this actually turn into a clinical result? So let's look at how we try to pair the ID and presence of antibiotic resistance genes with the susceptibility and uh, clinical practice standards in an algorithmic approach to, to try to come up with what is the best choice with respect to antibiotics when you're trying to manage these patients. And this recognizes the fact that, especially in the elderly population, we're going to see a large number of these polymicrobial um, infections. So let's let's take a look at this report and start with the the part at the top. Where we're basically looking in this particular case, we had four organisms found within this patient's urine. Once again, as we recognize this, it's probably also important to understand that in this particular case, since since standard urine culture is what this test is based on, there's a very linear relationship between CFUs that would be traditionally uh, identified using a standard uh, urine culture report and our cells per mil here. We basically see a direct relationship between CFUs and cells per mil. So when we say 100,000 cells per mil, this would have corresponded to the um, 100,000 that would normally uh, be seen urine, uh, using a standard urine culture. So we have four, pay, uh, four organisms found in this particular case. So it's a polymicrobial infection. Um, we tested against 19 different antibiotic or antibiotic combinations. Um, in, our, in our report and how it's uh, set up, um, the antibiotic that produced the best result would be on the left-hand side and then on the right-hand side. So as we move to the right, uh, these become uh, less of a preferred, uh, preferred antibiotic um, based on this specific patient pattern. So once again, this, this is basically, as we would say, the old personalized medicine um, approach. For these organisms, Cipro in this particular case worked out to be the best choice. Um, from a formulation standpoint, we always will um, prefer 
oral over IV options if they're available. Um, sensitive under four is always preferred over resistance. So here we have a case where um, we have for these particular four organisms an oral formulation where we have a series uh, of these formulations that have demonstrated uh, sensitivity respect to the four organisms that we see. We're always going to prefer situations where there was no antibiotic resistance genes found within that population. So sensitive, no antibiotic resistance gene would be preferred over sensitive and the presence of a resistance gene. Beneath that is the MIC results for these. Finally, it's also important to understand with some of these organisms, there may or may not be clinical information that supports the use of this particular antibiotic with this particular group of organisms. So as we see here, um, these four um, organisms in this particular case um, had clinical recommendations for use with uh, Cipro, demonstrated a pooled sensitivity result, had an oral um, uh, formulation available, and no antibiotic resistance genes um, present. Uh, so that basically provides an understanding of how we put these uh, together. Um, so when we look at this, um, what we basically find that in about 41% of the time, we're going to find a antibiotic found here that would be more effective than if we had used standard urine culture, uh, things that traditionally would not uh, be seen together. Next slide, please. So let's kind of look at some of the challenges that this test provides. Uh, first of all, um, from an accuracy standpoint, we're going to see that PCR clearly um, provides more accurate results, uh, both from a sensitivity and specificity uh, standpoint, especially with respect to sensitivity where uh, we see that uh, using this method, we're going to see about 43% more bacteria than we would have seen using standard urine culture. Most importantly, however, there's a time component here that's very important. Standard urine culture going from three to five days, um, where we typically can produce results roughly in about 24 hours with our current methodology. Um, probably worth noting as we move into the fall, um, with an enhanced methodology, we see this result coming down to about 14 to 16 hours. Um, next slide, please. So which patients benefit? Uh, well, once again, you know, we started this conversation with, with the fact that um, this isn't a screening test. This isn't meant you know, as, as a screen because what you're going to find is, and especially now that we understand um, that patients have microbiomes, and these microbiomes uh, may often contain organisms that we might describe as, as uropathogens. So, so, for example, patients with asymptomatic bacteria very clearly um, may be found with very high uh, counts for E. coli and other uh, what we would call traditional uropathogens. Um, but without presenting symptoms. I mean, there's, there's, there's clearly a relationship that is occurring uh, between the microbiome and these, um, what we would otherwise term um, pathogens um, that we don't want to disrupt. So what we're really looking at is, is how, do we, how do we use this test appropriately? First of all, we want to use it in symptomatic patients. We want to look specifically or, or very clearly at patients with recurrent and persistent urinary tract infections, uh, especially those that are advantaged by culture. Why? Because we understand that the very, uh, a very likely reason why uh, they may have persistent infections is because the culture is otherwise missing organisms that, that might have been managed um, if the test had been more sensitive and specific. Uh, clearly, we would want to use this on patients with uh, negative urine cultures, but we're still symptomatic. Um, it's also very well suited for catheterized patients and patients with incontinence, and especially with patients with known antibiotic allergies. Uh, next slide, please. Um, to this date, we've completed uh, four large uh, clinical trials uh, to support the development of this work. We did a original internal validation. Um, our first um, clear study was a 500-patient clinical validity study that was done um, on patients 60 and older. Uh, uh, our first large uh, randomized trial was a prospective trial um, with three arms where we looked at 2,518 patients uh, from 37 urology offices in seven states um, with a mean age of 73. 
uh, where we compared uh, the clinical outcomes of treated patients based on culture or our guidance UTI result. And then uh, most recently, we looked at a 66,000 patient cohort retrospective study where we were looking especially at rates of hospitalization, emergency room um, visits um, in this population. Uh, next slide, please. Um, these studies have resulted in a number of peer-reviewed publications, <clears throat> basically looking at clinical validity, uh, analytical validity, and then uh, clinical uh, utility. Uh, what we've basically been able to demonstrate over time is, is the test uh, is both sensitive and specific, and from a clinical outcome standpoint, um, as we're going to see, it has resulted in a significant reduction in emergency room and hospitalizations um, associated with performance of the test. Um, at the same time, uh, we've started to describe mechanistically um, the development of or the identification of groups of organisms, and these groups of organisms um, have been able to be demonstrated that over time that the presence or absence of certain of these pairs significantly uh, increase or decrease the antibiotic susceptibility uh, uh, characteristics of these uh, uh, groups of organisms. Next slide, please. Um, let's look at some of the data identified here. One of the things we note um, significantly, and there's a group of organisms not detected by stern, standard urine culture that we are seeing uh, using this methodology, once again suggesting uh, that there is a, a significant prominent miss using standard urine culture as, a pair, as uh, compared to uh, molecular methodologies. Next slide, please. And that this miss often manifests itself in missing uh, what would otherwise be termed polymicrobial infections. Um, when we look at these cases, um, in general, especially when we look at uh, uh, patient populations above age 65, we're going to find a significant uh, population are polymicrobial in nature. In this particular case, about 56% of all cases identified in this population are polymicrobial in nature. And when we compare this methodology to what we would see to standard urine culture, we see that standard urine culture is going to miss about four out of every five polymicrobial infections. Um, how does this impact things? What we would find is that about one in five times, by not having the correct identification, we would have missed the correct antibiotic. Next slide, please. Let's look at some of these specific interactions. And, and how they may change outcomes. So once again, we, we identified 13 specific bacterial uh, pairs that are commonly found that change these interaction patterns. Um, if you look in, uh, in the uh, first um, graph on the left, it gives a, a fairly interesting phenomenon. Um, in about 30% of our cases, uh, with cephalocor, we would have seen an uh, antibiotic uh, uh, resistance uh, for E. coli, roughly about 20% with Febsiella. When we look at these found together, there's a significant additive effect where we find that upwards of 50% or more of these uh, organisms, when they're found in pairs, are known uh, demonstrating resistance. At the same time, we can see down regulation. So when we look at tetracycline, upwards of 40% of the cases demonstrating tetracycline resistance roughly 20% with Club Seattle, but when we look at them together, we see a decrease um, in resistance with respect to E. coli and an increase in resistance with respect to Club Seattle. Um, and once again, these pheno uh, phenomena have been shown to be um, uh, reproducible, and we began studies to look at these from a mechanistic standpoint to understand what's uh, happening from an interactional uh, level that might be driving this process. Very important finding, however, though, because the, the, the challenge is, is, is if you were looking at these as just results from pure culture and looking at E. coli only and looking at susceptibility patterns, um, we clearly would be missing something with respect to um, how we would have uh, looked at this data. Uh, next slide, please. So let's look at some real-world data. Um, and this was probably looking at roughly 100,000 cases worth of uh, data over a 12-month period. 
where a standard urine culture would have missed eight types of bacteria in all the samples. It would have missed about 5,800 samples with fastidious bacteria. It most importantly would have missed 17,000 cases of polymicrobial infections with over 9,000 having uh, different pairs of organisms that would have changed the susceptibility patterns to antibiotics if you had known they'd been present. Um, so what really would have happened, standard urine culture would not have provided the correct antibiotic choices for that group of pathogens, and on average, it would have taken them over a day longer to provide the results. And what's the net impact of this? What ultimately, in my mind, is, is the driver of many of these things is, is our need to move time to result faster. Because frankly, every day that we wait drives empiric treatment from a clinician standpoint. If we can move it from four to five days to under a day and hopefully eventually to, you know, under four to eight hours, four to eight hours, now we have a situation where empiric treatment does not have to be the first choice that clinicians reach for when trying to manage these patients. And once again, if, if, if there is a societal risk uh, long term, not only from UTIs, but really from all infections, is the common uh, need for clinicians to, to turn to empiric treatment to manage patients because, frankly, their symptoms are acute enough and strong enough that they don't want to wait to have to go ahead and intervene. The faster we can turn our results out, the more likely we're going to be able to be able to treat these patients um, not only more rapidly, but more accurately. Next slide, please. Um, from an outcome standpoint, from a clinical utility standpoint, when we look at the results from our 66,000 uh, patient study, what we saw was a 13.7% reduction in emergency uh, department and hospital visits per year and roughly a 22% reduction in costs. Um, in developing data that we're looking at now from a more significant population, we find that those reductions are even more dramatic. Uh, next slide, please. And once again, I think the drive to all of these things, you know, as we add in testing, can't be to drive more testing and more antibiotic uh, use. Ultimately, what we need to do is to be able to have more accurate tests that provide more reliable results uh, such that uh, we reduce the amount of antibiotics being used. And when we do have to use antibiotics, we use them in such a way that we provide the antibiotic that's most appropriate for the group of organisms found rather than the organism that we believed to have been found um, using methodologies that may not have been as sensitive and specific as we might have hoped. Uh, next slide, please. Um, what we see ultimately is, is the development of these molecular methodologies and combining them with these, these phenotypic studies um, have shown a, a series of advantages to using these types of approaches. Uh, first of all, we've seen significant improvement in, um, from a clinical validity standpoint. We have a much more sensitive and specific test. Um, because of that, we see vastly more bacteria that are found there um, which have been demonstrated to be uropathogens, as we would have found previously using, using standard urine culture. And consequently, from a polymicrobial infection detection rate, um, we see um, significantly more polymicrobial infections that would have been otherwise seen um, uh, using standard urine culture. And perhaps most importantly, um, we've significantly reduced the turnaround time such that we now have a situation where we're more likely to be able to turn on a result where clinical in intervention is going to have a bigger impact and hopefully driving less reliance uh, on empiric treatment. 